morning, everyone, and welcome. We apologize in advance for being a little bit oversubscribed. We'd anticipated that we'd have at least a 10% that were NHL fans and were sleeping in this morning, but obviously not. Uh, my name is Julie Caffley. I'm Senior Vice President, Policy and Partnerships at the Public Policy Forum, and we're delighted to be beginning our very long day uh, with you today at this very important breakfast. Um, we're delighted to have all of you this morning, uh, including very uh, a large number of special guests. I'd like to offer a particular welcome to the Honourable Elizabeth Dowdswell, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, who's joined us this morning. As many of you know, her honour cares deeply about these issues and is a great champion for the sector. I want to begin by acknowledging the land in which we're gathered this morning. Um, as you know, we're gathered on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Métis, and most recently, the Mississauga of the First Credit uh, First Nation. Today, uh, Toronto is home to many Indigenous people from Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to gather on this land. Much of this discussion this morning started at our first growth summit last year, um, where Dominic Barton was one of our keynote speakers. And uh, we stopped counting at about seven or eight mentions of agri-food in his keynote remarks. And um, needless to say, all of the egg folks in the room were particularly keen of the interest of the growth uh, council around this theme. So we're delighted to have Dominique with us this morning, as well as uh, Ilsa Trunick, who's also a member of the growth council and also uh, delightfully a member of the board of the Public Policy Forum. This morning we encourage you to use uh, social media networks to discuss the event. Uh, the Twitter hashtag is CDNAG, as you'll see up on the screens, CDNAG, and ppforum.ca is our uh, Twitter handler for the Public Policy Forum. Many of you know the Public Policy Forum. Many of you have contributed to our recent engagement process right across the country. Um, uh, it was very much uh, an elaborated uh, engagement session that happened in a very short period of time, uh, being in Vancouver right to Charlottetown, and so we are quite proud of the engagement that was done around this initiative. Um, as you know, the Public Policy Forum looks at breaking down barriers between leaders from different sectors. Um, within this engagement process, we had uh, amazing contributions from many different sectors, all who cared uh, deeply about the issues and provided important uh, recommendations that are in our report uh, that is being released today. We are pleased to work with Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute on the consultation process. They were great partners. And uh, within that process, we heard from over 150 leaders within the sector and beyond the sector uh, regarding the recommendations that you'll read in our report this morning. We did also use the recommendations uh, from the Finance Minister's Advisory Council on Economic Growth as a starting point for these discussions. And so, as I mentioned, we're delighted to have uh, Dominique here with us. As you'll see in the report that we released today, stakeholders see this as an unprecedented opportunity. They agree with much of what is seen in the Advisory Council's recommendations, and they have thoughts on how to galvanize the momentum and achieve the vision of, Can of Canada being the trusted global leader in safe, nutritious, and sustainable food. We are grateful to many, many partners on this project, and I will take the time to name them, um, and you'll have to be a bit patient because we have many partners. Uh, the Food and Consumer Products Canada, RBC, CropLife Canada, Pulse Canada, Genome Canada, Campotex, Agrium, the Canadian Produce Marketing Association, the Canadian Canola Growers Association, the Canadian Seed Trade Association, Farm Credit Canada, Fertilizer Canada, Soy Canada, and the Agricu Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. So please take a moment to thank our partners for this initiative. It's now my pleasure to hand things over um, to Keith Ball, who is the Director of Ocean Transportation and Supply Chain for Campitex, who will introduce our uh, keynote speaker. 
Campitec helps feed the world by marketing and exporting Saskatchewan potash internationally and facilitating global farmer education programs. Um, I'd also like to add in the Saskatchewan connection um, and deep gratitude to our new director of policy, Lindsay Martins, who uh, led this initiative um, quickly upon his arrival to the forum. So I will pass things over to Keith. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, as Julie mentioned, my name is Keith Ball. I'm the Director of Ocean Transportation and uh, Supply Chain for Campitex. And I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker this morning. Campitex is honored to support this event as this morning's discussion topic is really at the heart of our organization, namely global food security and feeding a hungry world. For those of you who may not be familiar with Campitex, we export potash overseas on behalf of our shareholders, Agrium, Mosaic, and Potash Corp. We deliver approximately 10 million tons of potash annually from Saskatchewan to 40 countries around the world, where it is primarily used as a fertilizer. Potash is needed by millions of farmers each year around the world to improve crop yields, quality, and disease resistance. And Canada is fortunate to be home to the richest deposits in the world. Put simply, Canadian potash plays an important role in helping improve global food security. And Campitex is proud to be among the Canadian exporters and innovators who are rising to the challenge of feeding a hungry world. To speak more directly to the topic and our theme of Canada as an agri-food powerhouse, I'm very pleased to introduce Mr. Dominic Barton. Dominic is the global managing partner of McKinsey. He is based in London and heads the firm's focus on the future of capitalism and the role of business leadership can play in creating long-term social and economic value. He previously served as McKinsey's chairman in Asia and led McKinsey's office in Korea. He is the chair of the Seoul International Business Advisory Council and a co-chair of the Focusing Capital on the Long-Term Initiative. He is also a trustee of the Brookings Institution, a Rhodes trustee, and an adjunct professor at Tsinghua University in Beijing. Dominic has authored more than 80 articles and is a co-author of Dangerous Markets, Managing in Financial Crises, and China Vignettes, An Inside Look at China. As chair of the Finance Minister's Advisory Council on Economic Growth, Dominic has placed a strong emphasis on agriculture and food, saying that feeding a hungry world is Canada's next big economic opportunity. Please join me in welcoming Dominic Barton. Well, thank you very much, uh, Keith, and also Julie and the Public Policy Forum for uh, setting, this, uh, setting this up. Um, it's a great honor to be here. I feel like it's something that you've all known for 50 years and we've just discovered or I've just discovered in the last year. So when I show you these slides, just smile along politely. <laughs> he finally gets it. I'm glad Ilsa's here, uh, one of the uh, 14 members of our, our council and also has been a very strong proponent uh, of this and pushing it forward also because of the technology uh, angle to, uh, to this. And also, the, the Lieutenant Governor, it's wonderful to have you here. You've been uh, pushing for a lot of breakthrough ideas uh, in this, and I know are a big supporter uh, in the ag food uh, side of things. What what I wanted to do is just quickly go through, um, uh, you know, what what we were recommending in the advisory council, and then more specifically focus on ag food. And I think it's more a setup for the panel. And uh, David uh, McGinnis uh, and the, uh, the the agri food policy group, Canadian agri food policy group, have done a terrific job, I think, in testing a lot of the ideas and recommendations across the country, I think in five uh, different groups. And so I think that we'll, we'll get some feedback on what seemed to make sense, what didn't, what the worries were. But, but what I want to say at the outset before getting into this is because I, I, I think that it's probably pretty obvious that ag food is a, and agriculture is a huge opportunity for Canada. The challenge is, are we going to do anything about it? Are we, what are we going to do to capture it. Uh, and the last thing uh, that I'm interested in and the Growth Council is interested in is, is uh, filling up another shelf full of paper. Um, and so we are very, very determined to make sure that we do something uh, and capture the opportunity. And I hope that we'll make that part of the discussion. How do we 
organized to make sure that we can actually capture this uh, huge, uh, huge opportunity. So let me just go through quickly uh, the, again, some of the, the context, and I'm gonna skip through some of these slides, so forgive me uh, for that. Uh, but basically, when, when we started the work um, about, I guess, a year and a half ago, we did a sort of a diagnostic, and we're looking at really how to increase the median income household family income in Canada over the next 10 to 20 years. It wasn't just about GDP growth, it was sort of more inclusive growth. That was the, the target. And then we just said, let's look at where we, where we stand. And we've got a lot of strengths and weaknesses. I'm, I'm not gonna go through it. I just wanna go to one chart that worried us uh, as we looked ahead and was an imperative for why we need to make some bold moves uh, over the next uh, few years. And that, one of the biggest headwinds we face is that we are literally one of the most rapidly aging populations uh, in the OECD. Korea and Japan have gone off the cliff. They're, they're past the point, and it's not a very polite thing to say, but from an aging point of view, beyond the point of no return, I think, on that side. And the biggest driver of productivity growth, which drives a lot of income growth, is labor participation uh, in the workforce. And as we look at Canada, in the last 50 years, we've had about a 3.1% GDP per capita growth rate on average. The bulk of that has actually become, has come from labor entering the market. It's been from immigration in the past, it's been from women uh, joining the workforce, it's been, been from having a relatively young population. That's gonna change significantly over the next 50 years. If we don't do anything because of our aging, we're gonna see that cut uh, from 3.1 to 1.5 or on a per capita GDP growth from 1.9 to 0.8. So those just set the, the bar for us in the Growth Council to say we've, we've got a, we have an aspiration to improve median income levels. We wanna improve it by $15,000 uh, per family by, by 2030, but we've got a significant uh, headwind. And what we, we also said was we're not gonna do what's typically done with many terrific reports is have 295 or 300 recommendations. We're gonna have less than a dozen because we think that's what really can fit the digestive track of the government. And that's not meant in any pejorative way. It's just that governments have a lot of things going on. So we wanna have less than a dozen, but they better be, they better shake it up, which means we have to prioritize in where it is. So that's just the, the context. And, and in that context, uh, we do think that there are some sectors, and in particular ag food, that we need to unleash because we've just got this incredible endowment and that can play a very significant role in closing the gap uh, for the need of what we wanna do. So it's not just because it's there, it's a must because if we don't leverage the endowments that we have, uh, we're not gonna have a very uh, prosperous uh, society over the next, uh, the next coming decades. So we, we basically have eight recommendations. I'm not gonna go through them in detail, but I wanna mention them because the other thing I like about agriculture and ag food is they actually uh, pull all of them together. All of the recommendations actually get pulled together within ag food. So the first one was around an infrastructure bank. We said there's over a $500 billion infrastructure gap in Canada, in cities, in our ports, in our electricity grids. Uh, we wanted a foreign direct investment agency because we're, we're receiving about a quarter amount of foreign direct investment as our OECD peers, people like Australia. And this isn't about companies coming in to buy our companies. This is, this is people that want to invest in R&D in our universities, right? That want to invest in Canadian companies and small cap companies to help them grow. And we just aren't even on the, on the map. We wanted to, uh, and we want to increase immigration. Uh, we think it's vital that we do it, and that may not be politically popular uh, all the time, but I think that's our heritage. We've been very good about that in the past, and it's our opportunity, uh, given what's going on in the world. And it's not just the high-skilled uh, side of it, which we're, we want to fast track. It's also the temporary foreign workers, and that's one thing I've learned from you over the, over the past uh, several months, just the challenge in trying to get workers for uh, the abattoirs, the mushroom farms, the many different 
uh, businesses that we have where there's just a lack of, of supply of talent. And I can tell you in the United States right now, it is a very big challenge. I think California is gonna be screaming uh, in the next year uh, when the, 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 the Trump uh, actions uh, move to play because they're gonna be very short of, of workers. So the infrastructure, foreign direct investment, immigration were the first wave uh, that we, we put through or wanted to, to get put through. And then the second wave, which we released in February, were around a big one on innovation because that's got to be part of this new knowledge economy. We have to become not necessarily more innovative because in Canada we've discovered we're actually very innovative. We, we, we don't have a lack of ideas. Our universities, our researchers, our entrepreneurs are actually phenomenal. What we have a problem doing is scaling those companies up. Uh, they, they don't scale. Uh, and often when they do get to a certain size, they get bought or they move to a different country uh, to move them forward. But to do innovation, you can't just have technology uh, that's out there. It has to be linked to a sector. This is where I come to food again and agriculture. And a lot of people who are ignorant, like myself from outside, if you were to say and think about innovation, you would not think about agriculture as the first thing, maybe not even the first five things, when in fact, as you well know, it is a hotbed of innovation, high-tech innovation. And our country has a massive track record on innovation in agriculture uh, in, in where it is. The Future Skills Lab, we're very worried with automation and technology that's changing that we're not going to be able to reskill our people in the country to be able to participate in the economy as it changes. There, there's various estimates. The Brookfield Institute and McKinsey, we've, we looked at it. Uh, but 40% of jobs we think could be automated in Canada over the next 10 years, right? Today, uh, 60%, for 60% of jobs, 30% of what they do today can be automated right now. So this is not 20 years out, it's happening now. But we need to ensure education systems keep up with where it is, and this is the same by the way, also for agri-food, which is becoming much more of a high-tech uh, industry. The sector growth, we're gonna talk about that. We, we, we identified uh, eight. The number one, and, and it, it wasn't just because of a personal bias or where it is, the group was not interested in that. We did analysis, I'm gonna show you. The number one sector that came out was agriculture and agri-food. That, that was the number one sector that came out of, of that on the, on the priorities. Workforce participation, this is to, again, we need more labor, even though we have fewer of the labor as we look ahead to participate. And we looked at particularly at some groups that are not participating as much, indigenous uh, people, uh, youth who don't have any education, and actually women. We've plateaued on women, so how do we crank that uh, back up? And then this notion of being a trading hub. We are, I think, uh, too dependent on the U.S. The U.S., it's an important market, and there's actually, we're not saying move away from it. We need to do more, but obviously that's not exactly the most, uh, you know, smoothest of times uh, when we're here. I don't know if anyone's from the dairy industry uh, in the room. Uh, but but the, we, we also have uh, massive markets where we've actually been losing share uh, over the last decade, and that's particularly China, India, and Japan. And we've got to have, we think, free trade agreements with those countries to, uh, to be able to ensure we can get all of our uh, products, our, uh, the companies that we're growing and building to participate in that uh, growth. So those were the, the, the recommendations, there's about, there's eight of them. We were very excited to see that the government actually in the budget made, you know, took action on every single one of them. And some we would have liked to have seen more and others they went way beyond what we were, but the point is they're moving and we're very excited by that. The, the challenge is then is the implementation, right, and, and how we, we drive that uh, forward. There's one more that we're actually looking at right now, which is business capital investment, which is a big driver, and it's been in decline over the last 10 years, so we're trying to figure out how to do it, but that, that'll be it. So that's just the, the context, but ag food uh, comes into that. So just stepping back on ag food, let's look at it globally. Uh, it's about a $13 trillion uh, business, one of the largest businesses uh, in the world, one of the largest employers uh, in, uh, in the world, important for consumer spending, important for greenhouse gas 
emissions. And again, Canada's blessed by being relatively much better than many other countries in the world uh, that, uh, that, that do this. Again, 40% of worldwide uh, employment comes from, uh, from this industry. Water, which is a, a huge issue, as you well know. Again, in Canada, we're, we're blessed. Uh, many of our, if I could say, competitors, and particularly if I look at the United States, are challenged uh, with the aquifers and so forth. That, that they, they don't have the resources like we do, or Brazil does, or Ethiopia, or Uganda, right? It's, a, it's interesting to see who our competition may be uh, over, uh, over time. Um, and of course, we've got this issue, as Keith mentioned, we've got to feed the world, which is no small challenge as we look ahead. So when you look at all of those factors, you say, boy, there's got to be an opportunity uh, for us on that. What's really going to drive this is the, this two billion middle class group that's coming into the system uh, over the next 15 years. This is unheard of in human history, the scale and speed with which this middle class is coming in. And they want to eat and live like we do. They want protein. They need proteins uh, like, like we do. And so we are going to see uh, very significant growth in pretty well every single category uh, that, that, uh, that is out there. We, as you know, I'm not going to spend really much. I don't, you can tell me more than I, I could tell you in terms of the opportunity. But I think w as Canadians, we, should, we better recognize what we've got here, which is massive. And as I said, I often like to do the thought experiment from living in South Korea for, for, for six years. I think South Korea is one of the most ambitious countries and populations. I don't want to stereotype people, but from a place that really has little, they have no resources. They have no power. They have no natural resources. They don't have the size uh, to be able to play it. They always call it the nutcracker. If they're between Japan and China and have been that way for 5,000 years. It's a, but the ambition, the raw ambition is massive, and I often do the thought experiment, what if South Korea owned Canada? What would they do? And I tell you, they would go completely crazy. On, if, they, if they had Vancouver Island, they'd go completely crazy. <laughs> so we should just, let's just appreciate uh, what we've got. We then sort of looked at all sort of different sectors in the world and looked at what the growth rate's been over the last five years, and then what our, the Canadian uh, relevant sectors growth rate has been compared to that and what you find I want is that actually agriculture is number one on the side so on a on a relative basis Canada performs well and on a absolute basis agriculture matters you do see real estate which obviously we have lots of challenges with that I would say that really that is a bubble uh, in the literal term um, but but agriculture comes out probably more critically, as we went through it too, in terms of in Canada, what we just literally said, let's take every sector and look at different elements to it. Uh, on its GDP contribution, believe it or not, education uh, plays uh, a very significant role. But if you look about employment contribution, remember what we're trying to do is improve the median incomes. That's what we're, we're focused on in our growth council. You focus on, uh, on ag food. And I think we're way underplaying the employment potential and the employment potential for high-skilled jobs uh, that, are, that are there. Another wonderful part about agriculture is that it's dispersed. This isn't just concentrated in one particular region in Canada. Every single uh, part of the country can play, uh, can play a role uh, in this. So when we then said, what, what are some of the challenges as we, as we look at ag food, we'd say, first of all, is we have a very underdeveloped value chain. What we mean by that is we, we ship a lot of unprocessed uh, goods and materials. We don't do very much of the processing, or certainly not as much as we could. Uh, we think that we only process about 50% of, uh, of the output. Uh, we've got challenges as it relates to infrastructure that we need to put in place on practically every element. Uh, but we also have a regulatory environment. This is something that we're looking at. It is a very complex regulatory environment. And one of the things that we think is this, to push agriculture and ag food is not just about, it's not about subsidies. We, we actually didn't focus any time on that. It's actually getting rid of things. Um, and and what, what we're, we're, get, we're doing more work on this, but our sense is that while we, our safety, the, fa the carbon emission, these are all extremely important for our brand and what we want to do. 
but the complexity of being able to try and get things done in our regulatory environment is very high when we compare it to even our, our, our competitors across the border uh, on that side. Even the, where, it, where it is today, let alone after what Donald Trump does to these regulatory uh, agencies and where it is. So we're not trying to be crazy about saying get rid of all right. We're just saying let's, let's factor in the cost of that as we, as we look at it. We actually have quite low productivity, you know, the size of our firms. And this isn't against being against small businesses or because many small businesses play a role in the supply chains, but we've got to face the fact. If anyone here has visited any of the farms, the soy farms in, in Brazil, which I've done a number of times, you, you have to fly an airplane to be able to get around the property. One I recently visited uh, about eight weeks ago is about 18 times the size of Manhattan. That's one farm. Right, that, that it looks like your NASA in terms of how they run the place and operate it. And again, I'm not saying we have to move all that way. I'm just saying that we need to think about scale uh, in in uh, in what we do. We think a lot of the government spending is focused on risk management, and we don't underplay want to underplay the importance of that. But there's a lot to be done on technology and education. How do we make sure that? young Canadians coming through here say, this is actually an industry I want to participate in. I can be an entrepreneur. I can have a very fulfilling life in building and innovating. We don't do very much on that side. And then, as I said, the trade barriers, we are missing in action. We're, we're doing quite well despite the fact that we don't have free trade agreements. But if we did, we could do much more uh, in China, uh, in India, and in Japan. One example I'd like to focus on, if we just focused on one city in China, right? There's, there's over a hundred cities with, with a million people in them. You take Chongqing, right? It's, it's, Chongqing is a city the size of Canada. It's got 35 million people in it. If we just, you know, we probably should have an ambassador to Chongqing, right, given its size. You think about the food consumption. If you talk to the mayor of Chongqing, the number one issue that that mayor worries about, the number one issue is food security and safety, right? So what are we doing to be linking up and supplying uh, products and, and value added to that? We have a lot of opportunity. So what we basically said uh, was when we look at uh, this, we, we want to crank up. We have to be ambitious. We should set a very high bar, and that's in some ways quite un-Canadian. We don't like to set big aspirations, and we need to. We, we should be very very bold about where, where we are. Just think about the South Korean uh, side of it. Again, the government's uh, embraced this. Again, the question is we have to do something uh, about it. Um, we need a new uh, policy framework, obviously, with the provinces and, and, and the, the national government. But we also can do a lot more on the innovation side of things where we have some, uh, some advantage. So what we basically were saying is let's, let's uh, increase our ag food exports by at least $30 billion over the next five to 10 years. I, don't, I actually don't think that's that ambitious. We have some colleagues on the Growth Council who thought it could be uh, higher. Uh, I think there are many companies in here that would see the, 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 the opportunities. Let's, let's not do 295 things. Let's focus on a few things to try and get the ball moving on where it is. And one of the things I'm keen that we do, in the, hopefully in the panel discussion too, is how do we organize ourselves to be able to get after this in a systematic way? Um, and then uh, I, I think again, the final point I just make is this is this, this is this is why I think it's wonderful that the Public Policy Forum is, in a sense, hosting us because this is a private-public collaboration. We need we need uh, and social sector for that matter. We all have to do it together. Um, so I'm just going to jump ahead. These are just some of the background charts as to what, how we didn't just make up the $30 billion number. We actually looked at how we were competing. I, I, do, I must say I find it shocking, again, where we are versus the Netherlands. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes uh, on that side of it. I also find it interesting about Brazil, and I mentioned this at a dinner last night. One of the ahas for me in looking at this is actually from outside the country looking at it. One in Brazil, this is about uh, six or seven years ago, I was visiting the founders of Brazil Food, and it's actually, it was a private equity firm that put the company together. These guys were, they looked like they were 19 years old. I, could, I said, where did you get the money to actually build this company? Right? It, it, caught, it, it took several billion dollars to buy and put this group together. 
and they, people mainly think I'm American for it, and they said, well, there's this pension fund in Canada called the Teachers, and they gave us, they gave us $2.2 billion, and I just about fell out of my chair. I said, really? He goes, yeah, they built our business. And I love teachers, that's great what they do, but it'd be nice if we could do it domestically uh, too in, in, uh, in where we are. And then just the agri-food products as well. Just look, look where we are again, Italy, uh, Belgium. I mean, what, is, what the hell is going on with, with that? Spain, uh, and then the Netherlands, way out there on, on, the, uh, on the extreme. Uh, so we, we said, let's try and disaggregate this. We picked four areas. This is still very much uh, in, in, uh, in discussion. We think aquaculture is a very significant opportunity in the pro team. We are un unbelievably blessed on that side with three, uh, three oceans and then a huge um, amount of uh, lakes and so forth. You know, oil seed and pulse crops, we tried to put some numbers to it. Dairy, and as was rightly pointed out by the Canada West Foundation, it's kind of it's hard to do that without dealing with supply management, and I'm not going to say anything more about that because I'll probably be kicked out of here for it, but, but that's, we have an opportunity uh, in that. Uh, and and agri-food technology, just even as a, as a subsector in itself, it is a very significant uh, opportunity. So those are some areas. It'd be great to get feedback and say, you've missed something. I can't, that's, too, that's not the right way to look at it. We, we, we think we've got to... We can't just have it as one mass. It's got to be broken down into some subgroups, and we're trying to figure it out. And we may again need to crawl before we run, even though we need to do the whole thing quickly. Let's sequence it. So that's how, how we're sort of uh, looking at it. Uh, we think there's an opportunity to put in some ag food processing hubs. I mean, again, I'm not, for the sake of time, going to go through it. I will just point out what the Netherlands did. We did look at this because it's, it's just amazing to see what organized, focused, efforts by both the government, universities, and private sector were able to do in a very short period of time. That was deliberate. The Netherlands didn't just pop up there by happenstance. It was a deliberate strategy. And it wasn't about subsidies. It was about getting out of the way. It was making easier for people to build things. And it was about coordinating things. And then you just, again, compare, look at the arable land we have and look at their agriculture to, uh, to, to, to GDP and, what they're, and the role that they play in the world. I could do a similar thing for New Zealand, uh, which again had a very aggressive program to say we've, this is a source of strength. What are we, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna deal with that? Uh, Brazil uh, has gone through it. So there's, I won't, again, for the sake of time, go there. there so there are many examples out there of, of, of doing it. I, last week I was just in Uganda where we were doing the, the, the big source of opportunity for Uganda, it's one, it's one of the jewels in Africa, is water, uh, and it's gonna be agriculture, right? And so there, I think I have an example, they did a coffee, it was a coffee lab, so we just spent a week bringing all the stakeholders together in coffee, right? Every, the suppliers, the people that are marketing it, the farmers, everyone, uh, representatives for a week. We literally did not leave them, let them leave the room. You know, you know, they obviously could sleep and so, but we, we didn't let them leave. And the view was, how are we gonna uh, increase uh, dramatically the amount of coffee that uh, this country can, can push through? The president was involved, the prime minister was involved uh, in doing it, and they came out, so again, their ambition is to go from four million to 20 million bags. But again, every, so, in my view, again, if Uganda can do that, I mean, we, we can do that, I think, easily in, in the many different uh, sectors of where we have a lot more infrastructure and so forth uh, that, that's there. As I mentioned, these uh, recommendations, we think, uh, are coaxial, or they all, they hang together in the sense that, you know, we, to make this work, we need the free trade agreements. That's something else we're trying to push, so we hope the other seven recommendations will reinforce what we're trying to do with agriculture. For the sake of time, I, I won't go through it, but we've tried to be quite explicit and deliberate about that on the, how the other elements help reinforce agriculture and, and, and ag food uh, as, as an opportunity. And so again, what we're keen to do is to, is to get a private sector group, and by private sector, it's not just business people, including universities, and in a sense, non-governmental, if I could call it that that could get together with an interdepartmental group, because obviously ag food cuts across many different areas, it's health, um, the environment, um, workforce, and so forth, 
Um, and then make sure that we do engage the provinces. I've spent a lot of time in Saskatchewan as part of the Growth Council doing this. We learned a lot from the Saskatchewan government and what they've been doing with their, uh, the, the ambition. Get some pilot uh, projects going and, and just get this thing moving. That's kind of the level of it. We, this is very rough thinking. Again, we've got different groups. I, we're, we're talking with the Ministry of Agriculture about what sort of a role they play, but I think we also need many of the other ministries. We've had lots of different views, including from the Ministry of Agriculture. It may not, we may not be the right people to do it. There may be others, whatever. We've got to think, though, about where this is done. What I would just say is on infrastructure, with the infrastructure bank, which we're very, there's a lot of progress that's been made. A key element of that has been having Jim Leach, from Ontario Teachers, by the way, who <laughs> is the person reporting to the Prime Minister who is helping ensure that we get the right implementation, because he's independent, he's not running for office, he's not looking for a job, uh, he's highly respected, and he won't compromise. And, and, and fortunately, the Prime Minister, that's exactly what the Prime Minister wants in where it is, and that, that can help ensure that we get an infrastructure bank that looks somewhat like we were hoping it to look like, because we understand politics can be involved, and I think the ministers are keen on that because they can work with them. We need to think about what is the equivalent of that in, in ag food or how to think about that. Again, we haven't done enough thinking, but are looking for your, your ideas on that, but we need, uh, we need that. So, uh, sorry, I've gone on way too long, David, on it, but I, I hope that's just given a bit of a context of where our thinking is. To me, the most important thing is implementation, that we actually get something moving this year uh, so that we can uh, demonstrate the huge potential that's there. Thank, thanks for listening. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, my name is David McGinnis. What, what we're going to do now is we're going to bring the five panelists up. And while they're accumulating, I'm just going to say a few quick words about the, uh, what we discovered uh, on our, our planes, trains, and automobiles trip across the country to eight cities in one month to with 150 uh, stakeholders. Just to add a little context that I hope will uh, seed the discussion. And then the panel's going to have a brief chat. And then we're going to open it up for questions uh, from you and then end this at uh, uh, 25 uh, past the hour. So just very quickly, um, I'm going to, in, in the words of one senior person in one of the cities, Dominic's and the council's report, I'd like to uh, flag Ilsa here, and the council's report, it's a gift. And the question is, what do we do with this gift? Um, Julie talked about it being an unprecedented opportunity. This is an unprecedented opportunity, and we heard that from all of you uh, in those eight cities across the country. Here's what we heard. Industry, in short, said, let's go, let's act. From the adjacent sectors, so this would be civil society groups, health and environmental groups, include us. We need to be part of this. The domestic marketplace is important. We need to ensure that this is about sustainable economic growth. And then from government, we heard, uh, we heard, let's have this co-shared. We need joint leadership to make this happen. That's essentially what we heard. A few key themes, though. The vision statement that Dominic and the council recommended uh, was a key one. And from all of the people across the country, this vision can link this sector. How to be a global trusted food leader can link the sector. It can also be a lens by which we can look at policies and strategies to make sure we're bringing it back to where Canada can go. The second key theme was that how do we, that is you, sustain this government focus on the sector? It was in the budget, we all know. Dominic and his council did a tremendous job. What about next year? What about the year after? How do we sustain this incredible attention on this important sector? Well, the stakeholders themselves came up with this, and that is that we, in order to remain as an economic priority, we really need to ensure that we're delivering societal co-benefits, demonstrating trust. What I mean by societal co-benefits, improving health and nutrition, improving the environment, and by delivering those co-benefits, we will, in fact, enable ourselves as a sector to continue to get that wide support across government and others. By bringing that attention to the sector, this is the way 
to attract investment, to attract talent, and to ensure public trust. This is what we heard, and it happened in every single city. Two other thoughts. Canada can really lead on trust. And why is that important? It's important because it enhances the Canada food brand. We heard this all over the place. It also is the key to ensure we have balanced regulation. Yes, we need a highly competitive regulatory framework. Could it be a comparative advantage? We hope so. But we need to ensure that trust is part of the, the equation. And that's something, and this is the feedback, that perhaps the council's report could have enhanced a little bit more. So this is what we heard. Final comment, uh, and that is, uh, Industry really needs to have confidence in government that the processes will be nimble and will be sharp and will be acted upon. We heard this across the country. For government's part, we also heard that they really want to see a new style of industry leadership. It has to be more inclusive. It has to include those other sectors. It has to include a greater degree of collaboration. And so there's a quid pro quo. This is not about government doing all. This is a new partnership. And so that is why in the CAPI Public Policy Forum report, uh, which by the way I like to call out Public Policy Forum, we're a terrific partner, and Lindsay Martins in particular, he and I were like, uh, like driving across the country to doing this road show. But on the processes, I just want to flag a few points and then I'm gonna introduce the panel. On this Ag Food Council suggested by the council, uh, great idea, it needs to ensure it includes the food system representatives, that is, maybe a technology person, software, health, environment. If it's only the supply chain players, we're not gonna build that collaborative space. The second is that it should report by the, to the center. It, this has to be deemed to be a pan-government uh, enabler. And so that was a very strong, in fact, an unequivocal piece of feedback that the value chain roundtables, while they can play certainly a role, they are not the holders of this strategy. And finally, in terms of this interdepartmental task force that was proposed that got wide support, as you can imagine, triage and prioritize. If this is about trying to solve every individual sectors and companies regulatory issue, this thing will collapse under the weight of itself. How do we triage, get some wins and move on? So essentially, you have the report in front of you. There's a lot of material there. Uh, we wish we could have put more in from all those 150 people, uh, but uh, we tried to bring it to, to synthesize it in the way we have, and I hope it's useful for you. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce our panel. Uh, we're gonna have a discussion amongst the panel members and Dominic uh, for a little bit, and then let's open it up for questions, and uh, hopefully this can be a really great discussion amongst you all. So we have Gord Bacon, uh, who's the CEO of Pulse Canada. Uh, we have Pierre Patel, who's the acting president of Crop Life. We have Mark Lepage, who's uh, the president and CEO of Genome Canada. Uh, we have Gwen Paddock, senior director, agriculture and resource industries at the Royal Bank of Canada. And, not, and uh, last but not least, uh, Carla Venton, who's Vice President, Food and Consumer Products Canada. Uh, could we just welcome our panel here? Okay, the floor is yours, uh, panel, and, and Dominic, who would like to start off? Uh, Gord. Well, first of all, thank you very much. It's a great honor to be up here, and it's a great honor to meet you, uh, Dominic. And, I really, really appreciated the report. It's got a lot of interest in the community. A couple things I'd, I'd like to see or suggest, and one of them is that uh, biotechnology and health, to me, are very much linked with ag food, and I think you heard some of that discussion so far. You know, we've, we have a great success story in Canada, and we need to continue to build through incremental improvement. I think what the report highlights is the opportunity to apply, and I'm gonna call them international lenses, because I do think if we're gonna be competitive economically, we need to look at some of these opportunities through an international lens. So things like food safety, packaging, and logistics in Canada, environmental sustainability, affordable food and affordable health, to me, are, are linked together. Um, these are things that we need to do in Canada through an international lens so that we're not creating, and to use your word, a suboptimal policy, which is trying to create an opportunity for Canada, but really 
perhaps isn't as is detrimental to us on a global stage. So I think these uh, drivers of, you talked about emerging um, drivers at the consumer level, but we have emerging drivers at the social level. And all of these drivers or these lenses, I think, are, are linked together through that digital backbone. So I think we can create this model. Um, my last comment, David, will be very much support the idea of coming from the center. I think we have a system in Canada, departments, ag organizations, including mine, we're very much siloed. And I think that the, we need that driver from the top to ensure that we, we don't fall back into the silos at a departmental level or at an industry level, that we look for these growth opportunities with these new drivers. And that's what's gonna be the catalyst for change. Thanks, Gord. Just, I'd like to stay with that theme. Would anyone else just like to top that up and then maybe Dominic can respond? Um, Carla, do you want to just talk, staying close to the theme that Gord introduced? Sure, so absolutely. I mean, talking about the um, Agri-Food Growth Council, the reporting of that to the centre, I think, is a great recommendation. I think that will ensure that the sector is prioritised and it will also ensure a whole-of-government approach. Um, we also feel that um, the sector is, has traditionally been siloed um, at all levels of government, and that has been an extreme challenge. Dominic, did this come up in, in your council's discussion? How do, you, how, do you, how do we reconcile this? How do we? Well, I, I think the point about the, you know, I think it's related, the whole of government and the, you know, thinking about healthcare, for example, uh, sustainability, I think very much was, you know, seen as a, as a part of uh, a part of that. I think exactly as you said, David, we probably could have highlighted it more. I think Ilsa was pounding the table very, uh, very hard uh, on this front, particularly on the sustainability uh, side of it. And I, I think it actually is, it's very much goes with the brand because I do think when, when you know, I mentioned food security, being a fundamental issue, it's it's food, it's safe food security, and in many countries around the world, we we've seen this, particularly in Asia, where there is a lack of trust by the population in the food system. So the Canadian brand, it, this isn't about getting a premium, but it is. Uh, it comes because of our the way our supply chain is done, and the fact that we think about it. I think the linkage to health is another very good uh, point to this as well. Obviously, these are. Uh, interrelated. So I, I think I, uh, those, those resonate. I think we probably could have pushed, uh, pushed that more. And I think the whole of government one, I very much agree with. I think the challenge is how to, you know, the, the Prime Minister probably can do so many things, right? And, I, and so how many of these can go directly in? And we just got to think about a mechanism. We know he's supportive of this, but what's the right mechanism to get it, give it the oversight to so that we can and we really just need oversight to de-bottleneck or to stop crazy stuff happening or someone saying we can't do that because mm -hmm. so that's what we've got to try and figure out uh, um, so so how do we turn that whole of government thing into a something that's like a, there's a bet like a chicken I could grab the neck but that's what I want to be able to do <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the right metaphor uh, Pierre yeah. <laughs> Just on, on the regulatory side, I mean, it's interesting to hear your comments about sometimes the regulatory environment just needs to kind of get out of the way or, or be streamlined a bit. And certainly in, in our sector, we are heavily regulated and there are some things very tangible, uh, ready to go that, that we have suggestions. So there are some things that we think can get done within this year to really move some of these recommendations forward on, on certainly on the biotech side and as well on, on the crop protection side. The other thing you mentioned is on, on uh, free trade agreements, and we 100% support that. And I think one of the areas that maybe wasn't as emphasized is non-tariff trade barriers. And so that's it's one thing to have free trade agreements, but if we're running into barriers related to whether it's MRLs or low-level presence, those are those are things that can really impede the ability of, of uh, Canadian growers to to export. So. Thank you, Mark or Carla. Mark, when we get Mark in, then sure. Carla. Uh, well, if I could make a comment, uh, just a quick comment on the, on the report. Uh, one uh, comment, uh, and they're related. The first one would be that uh, on uh, growth, on targets, I'm with Ilsa. Uh, I feel the, the, the report kind of understated the, the scale of the opportunity. And uh, we see that uh, in our work. Uh, people are working on soya. You can see how much, much more yield per acre. And because of climate change, you're going to have 16% more growing space available. So this is a massive, for a big, big crop, this is a big 
increase. Uh, forestry, let's go into plants, big plants, but uh, related, your cousins. Uh, the Scandinavians grow five times more wood mass per acre than we do, and there are some private Canadian uh, companies that are applying that. So the application of technology, uh, five times, that's not 5%, that's 500%. You know, it's, a, it's another scale. Uh, Saskatchewan had a fantastic uh, plan to double their production, I think, over 10 years. They exceeded that way ahead of schedule. So this thing has been done, can be done, on a, and I think it's on a different scale than what you're, at least what we're seeing. And related to that then is uh, the, the opportunity and the size of the opportunity, which everybody in this room understands. But outside of this room, this is a sector, old sector, slow growth, uh, we're, you know, artificial intelligence, digital apps. And um, we saw it in the budget, the last federal budget, there were a ton of measures for clean tech, uh, four or five times what there was. It was a great breakthrough for agriculture. It's a very good start. But uh, I think uh, the effort around clean tech is the appropriate effort. It's what's going to move the needle in that sector. It's not, the effort on, on agriculture is, is not uh, appropriate. And at the day of the budget, just as a little uh, comparator, I, I went on the websites. So I went to the great website of STDC, uh, Clean Tech, how big is it? 800 companies, $16 billion, pretty striking. And you know, there's a logic to what we're doing there. I went to the Canola Council. I invite you to go over there. There's a big study on canola. So something that didn't exist 40 years ago, uh, innovation, deployment, all of that. Canola, one crop. It's 26 billion. Clean tech, all of Canadian clean tech today, 16 billion. One crop, it's 26 billion. So the scale of the sector, I think, is misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, uh, I wanted to commend the, the committee because you're shining a light on this. And, and as an outside view, I guess, of what uh, of the sector and its importance, uh, maybe we're too close to it as a as a country. We don't quite see it yet. So. Uh, uh, so again, okay. the scale and and the, uh, the maybe the targets. Uh, I think uh, we should be more ambitious. Carla had her hand up, and then Gwen, I'd like to bring you in. Carla? Sure, just um, briefly. So uh, I think the root of a lot of the issues that we face are the fact that um, government just needs to talk to one another more. And so um, both at all levels of government and within government. So on the one hand, we have a fantastic opportunity. We have the government, um, the economic departments at the federal government level pushing innovation and growth and are willing to support us there. On the other hand, we all have uh, many examples in which we have other departments that are doing things that are counter and are not aligned to those objectives. And so I think that, um, you know, the, the, the idea of the whole of government approach and the go government talking to one another is really important. With Health Canada, for example, what we face is that we have Health Canada proposing stop signs on Canadian iconic products like cheese and maple syrup. It's hard to envision uh, building Canada's brand as a global food player when we have stop signs on our own products here in Canada to tell consumers not to eat those products. Thank you. And Dominic, if you want to jump in and answer any or speak to any of these points, feel free. Uh, sure. Gwen? Yeah, so uh, it was quite exciting as the work of the advisory committee was going on and you heard that ag and agri-food was, was uh, in their sites and thought, geez, that would be great. And I think what I'm probably most excited about, uh, so very excited that ag and ag-food is one of the target sectors, but excited that it's the pilot. And when you are in a position of being the pilot, uh, that allows you to choose some bold moves because you're testing what, what uh, could be the possible template for other sectors. It also acknowledges that sometimes some of what you try may not work, but that's okay because that's part of the pilot. So to me, I think being chosen as a key sector, but being chosen the part pilot sector, I think are a real win. Thank you. Gord? Yeah, just a quick comment, uh, Dominic, on your slide that you talked about the $30 billion growth. In the report, you also added, and you recommend that two-thirds of it should come from value-added processing. I think that's a really key comment because growth into commodity markets will take you down and put emphasis on certain parts of a strategy. Growth into value-added processing can be different. It doesn't have to be, but sometimes it's different. And I'll use an example where you know, we have had the benefit of some major investments in the pulse industry, and now the question comes all the way back to the genetics in terms of sort of looking at what we need to do. So I think we have to go forward consciously 
um, with understanding that at times and, and perhaps many times there's a difference between a simple commodity growth strategy and one where you're taking a look at value added processing and I was talking to Carla uh, from uh, Food and Consumer Products Canada earlier this morning say so food companies become really key they become part of the driving of the innovation because they're at the consumer end of the chain so really are we questioning or what we're looking at is that it is is it a supply push or a demand pull because we will allocate resources differently depending on how we look and tackle that question. I mean, what, I'm just to pick up on that, and it maybe relates to, to some of the I informal trade barriers point that was made as well, but I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, again, when you, you look at Canada from outside, sometimes I think maybe right, we're too close that we, you, you see it. One thing that, of, of a number of things that surprises me in this sector is we don't have very many um, General Mills, Unilever, you know, we and, and we should. There's no reason why we shouldn't. And, and I was getting educated last night uh, at a dinner, maybe with some Western Canadian, about how 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 we're going to eat differently over time. A lot more of it through snacks, not through three meals a day. And how you're going to have to try and make sure you get protein into that. So the really understanding the consumer and being on that end is essential. And that's we know in the value chain. That's where a lot of you know value shifts, but if you don't know that end of it, you, then you're just a commodity that's playing the markets with many other people that are that are out there. So I think the I couldn't agree with you more. The opportunity to build organizations that are thinking about you know nutrition of millennials may make it up, or or let's let's think about the 200 million middle class consumers in China, we, why can't we know more about them than they know about? We can do that. And so why don't we build some consumer product companies that are going to be branded properly, have the right ingredients and mix of th that fit the lifestyle. And that's where a lot of the value is. So I, I think that's a, I think we, that's why we think we have to look at the whole value chain. And, and that's, again, most people, and, and I, this isn't to denigrate the, the, the production because we need that and that's an advantage. But it's not just about farming or taking it from the land. It's a, it's that. And I, by the way, I just say one other thing. It's interesting. Some of the one of the biggest shifts going on in the mining industry. If you think about digitization, some of the leaders in digitization in the world, in all industries, are mining companies. And you'd say, really? I mean, surely retailers and banks and so forth. It's actually mining companies. You know, Barrick Gold wants to be a digital company because a lot of actually their activity can be improved through artificial intelligence and, and that's again where I, I think we've got to get people to see that sort of that that side of the equation so I think maybe one of the things the, that hopefully this this group would do is it's also about educating because part of this is about educating Canadians and young entrepreneurs coming through to say there is a very big opportunity here to build many, many businesses. And so, sorry, I'm just repeating my, but that, that so I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's why these free trade agreements are critical because the, if we're not careful, we, we will just be a commodity supplier. And that's, a, that's fine, that we, we will, we, you know, that, that creates value and GDP. But if, when you have a brand and you have, um, you have products that are actually recognized and so forth, and you have a consumer that wants it, that can blow through the barriers that go through it. It's, you know, we had our challenges with canola. If, if you translate that to then what is it that that consumer is actually eating and you're saying the government's trying to prevent me from buying what I want to, you will get a riot. And so I think these things kind of reinforce each other. Carla? What I want to say is it's just so unique that, that we are looking at opportunities beyond the farm gate. This, this is unprecedented, and so and and pointing out, um, uh, you know that there that we in Canada there's only 50% of agricultural production is processed here, and having these conversations beyond and looking at that untapped uh, remaining 50% potential because that that's just a completely different conversation. Of, I think it's really started with a boost from the advisory council report and continued with this report today, um, and it, and it's being readily adopted by uh, the federal government. So very unique opportunity here. I'm going to uh, move very soon into reaching out to you and getting your questions. Uh, and while you're formulating your juicy question, I'm going to ask Dominic and the panel 
uh, to answer this one. And that is, there's a lot of uh, emphasis put on this proposed Ag Food Council. Uh, the CAPI Public Policy Forum report uh, offered some enhancements to that to try to make it better. Imagine we're six months from now and that group is issuing its uh, a report, an interim update, six month report on progress. To all of you, what needs to be in that six month report? Pierre, I'm gonna start with you and all right. <coughs> see what happens. Well, I mean, Canada will never be, we'll never have a 12 month growing season. We're never gonna have cheap labor to, to, for, for agriculture. Uh, we're, we're never going to have lax environmental laws, so nor should we. So what is our competitive advantage? And I think if we can be that fastest to market with new technologies, if we can be the most predictable, most science-based system, the innovation will come. Our, our members are certainly poised. They're, they, they do innovate. They invest. But we need to differentiate Canada. There's a lot of other countries out there that are competing for those same innovation investment dollars. And Canada isn't going to stand out on those other things that I mentioned. We do stand out on access to our natural resources. We do stand out on the ability for Canadian farmers to readily adopt technologies, and they've demonstrated that. So in terms of this, this council, we would want to see a, a firm commitment and action on some of these, what we call low-hanging fruit on the regulatory side that can be done that will really truly enable some of these investments and innovations. Thanks. Anyone else like to offer? Uh, yeah, I could uh, throw something. Uh, 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 one of the recent things that got everybody's attention is the super clusters. So six months from now, there's a group that's gotten together around the ag food theme. And six months from now, I think you'd have uh, ideally a proposal, uh, pan-Canadian focusing on multiple themes, on processed foods, on uh, data issues, on regulatory reforms, on uh, all kinds of aspects. And they, they could stand up here and, and give us, here's the, uh, the, this community's big plan for the, the, uh, the super, super cluster. First one out of the gate and it would be strength. So that this is underway now and uh, I think it would, it would look a bit like your advisory committee. So at one point you say, wow, this, I think six months from now, everybody who's in this field who matters is kind of there. Maybe this is our advisory group right there. Anyone else like to jump in? Gwen? Just, uh, uh, Dominic, in your opening remarks, you talked about the report going on the shelf and perhaps collecting dust. And in six months, uh, what I think would be success is if the advisory committee is set up, it has a roadmap for how to, uh, how to achieve the goals or the recommendations that are outlined in the report with uh, key deliverables as far as timelines for when that will be done and then accountability for who's going to do it. So a real focus. Thank you. Gord. And I think in the six month report of this Ag Food Growth Council, we're going to have very solid lines between all of these uh, pockets of money that government has and policy initiatives to show that we now do have alignment, that we don't have uh, suboptimal policy approaches and that any investment that government is making, whether it's in a uh, next policy framework for agriculture, science cluster, super clusters on through that they're linked. Because if we don't link the investments, we're not going to have a coordinated strategy. And I think that that Ag Food Growth Council, because we're talking about environment, we're talking about affordable food and affordable health care, we're talking about economic growth, these investments by government need to be linked and coordinated and we'll say we're on our road to success. Thank you. Carla? Uh, I think the recommendations have to be very focused and I think there has to be few of them. Going back again to uh, the points raised here is we can't, we can't be everyone, everything to everyone. Um, and I also think that industry has to step up to the plate in, in their participation and put aside our differences. And I think we have to focus on what we can achieve and what we can achieve together that will benefit the entire value chain. So in this confidential discussion we're having, so Dominic, just between us, uh, what's your advice to cabinet for in six months and what would you like to see this out? Uh, uh, there are very good ideas that have been put here. I mean, I think that, um, for, for me, the uh, building on what's been said here, I think we need to have uh, a coordinator or owner. As I said, not the, just like the chicken would uh, can grab. The, we need because it's too. There's so many different parts to it that someone to. So we need a champion. I think you don't get things done without a champion. Doesn't mean that person's going to do it all, but they there. So we need someone. I think to to be able to help get this up. Two is we need as Gwen. So I, I'd love for the council to be established. Who are the people? It's got to have the mix 
across all the different, not only sectors within ag food, but as you mentioned, health, um, the environment, and so all the different elements. It has to be a technology, I think, the, the right mix up, and I think it can't be more than, if it's more than 15 people, it's chaos. I, I think you, 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 so it has to be, by definition, that that's hard, because you, you gotta pick, but so, so getting the, the right group with the leader in place, and we've decided where it, if you will, who provides oversight to, in, to, in terms of how that works. That would be one piece. The second is that we actually have some sort of a sequencing plan, right? And, and not to use boring consulting, like a, I'd have a matrix, which would just be, it's the, it's the sort of the significance or potential of the sub sector, if I could call it that, and then the ease of getting something done. And so, you know, I told you, I think dairy is a very big opportunity. I think that's probably a pretty challenge. I wouldn't make that the first thing uh, we go after, right, and, and where it is. But if I think about some of them, oil seeds and pulse crops, or act, but I would, I would get some sort of a order of play that, that, okay, we're gonna start this thing, and then there's a, uh, there's a time frame. I, this won't happen overnight, but I think it's gotta have a, you know, and you may push back and say this is way too, I, I think it probably takes three years to get to work through the system, but with very tangible milestones. You get one subsector, if you will, it was done, move on to the next, we learn, maybe the, so, so to me that is getting it, I think it's really important to get it set up right, and, and one of the already learnings I've had, because I already had some ideas, we in the Growth Council had a discussion about this, what, three weeks ago. I actually thought this one was more straightforward until you gave me the results of your report. So I, th I think this is a little more complicated than we thought about how we get it set up. So let's get it set up really as well as we can with the right ownership and accountability and then get it, get it moving. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, questions from the floor and they could be directed to anyone. And what we're gonna to try to avoid is everyone answering each yeah. question just for the sake of time. Morris. For, for food security in Saskatchewan. Um, I spent a bit of time in Australia and um, looked at the way they marketed Australia as a brand. And I think uh, uh, that we've got something to learn there because we've been so used to exporting commodities uh, that the carryover of the provenance of those commodities is, is often not there. Um, Obviously, there's a role for companies. They brand their products. What about the role of government in Brand Canada? Yeah. Anyone like to take that on? Uh, okay. well, one thing I'll say about brands is I, I really feel strongly that we need to have these global lenses of sustainability, health, uh, food safety, etc. We have to make sure that we're aligned and leading at, at an international level. I also, this is another reason why I like the Prime Minister to be part of it, because I think he has to lead those discussions. I'm very concerned about things like carbon pricing, which undermine the economic competitiveness of Canadian agriculture, yet advance something that's very important. So we, yes, we have to be part of sustainability, and food has to be part of reduction of climate change factors. But we have to make sure that we're doing it in a way that that's aligned on a global basis. So I think our brand will be to show leadership in the area of health, sustainability, food safety, uh, transportation, logistics, efficiency, et cetera. And I think that's how we'll be seen to be relevant around the world. Well, we're good. I've had three or so hands, four hands here. We're gonna take, let's do three or four quest, quick snapping questions. Please identify yourselves. And then that gives the panel the out if they, if they want to avoid one. No, if there was a gentleman right here, could you stand up? And then, and then Paul, right, oh sorry, Jim, you have the mic, I'm sorry. So okay, the four thanks. of you so, ask your questions and let's uh, see what happens. So Jim Everson from Soy Canada, and I, I like the targets, you know, targets are great because everybody can, can, can look to, a, to something to achieve and I, the $30 billion uh, sounds terrific to me. I, it's partly, uh, I think, a pickup on Gord's question is, the easiest way to get to that, it seems to me, is to ramp up what we already do really well, which is exporting raw commodities as opposed to the value-added message you have, Dominique. So I'm wondering what the single most important thing we can do in the short term to promote value-added as opposed to raw material exports. Um, and questions for Dominique or, or perhaps Gord has a comment on it. Okay, so then we're keep, hold that question, please, and then we're gonna go to uh, 
Uh, who do we have here? Rory? We'll just we'll do, we'll, we'll do the four of you. Rory, you stand up okay. if you don't mind. Well, uh, my quick question, I got a lot, but one would be how do we connect the conversation in this room to the people that live a block away in all the condos and you know shop at Pusateri's? And, and what I'm trying to get to is there is this major sociocultural phenomenon around food and what's driving food attitudes to food on the consumption side that is very linked to now how politicians are addressing our sector. And um, I, I guess I'd like to challenge the panel to ask, you know, if a consumer is looking at this as the future, how do we make that real for them in a way that's going to create the economic opportunities? But, you know, you talked, David, about the co-benefits, that whole piece of it that seems to be very in tune with the way the politician wants to speak about our sector and, uh, and how that then conflicts us. Okay, actually, we're going to pause because those are two big questions, then go to those two gentlemen. Uh, so. Dominic, could you want to, uh, how do we answer well, that co-benefit? Well, one? something else we want to jump into on the, on the, because I couldn't agree more on the value at that we've got to push that. I think part of it is just by illustrating what the opportunity is within that. And I think we've not, it's vague for most people. They don't see that. I think government, regulators don't see it. Government uh, entrepreneurs don't, don't see it. So I think making that visible and showing the example, and if I think about Australia, or New Zealand, or even, believe it or not, Kazakhstan, right? Ka I would argue Kazakhstan's ahead of us on some of the value added. So what is it, what, what does that look like? Um, and what's the potential in terms of jobs and, and investment? The only other thing I'd say is I, I also feel like there's a, a need capital talks. And why don't, why, why aren't we, we we're home to some of the best pension funds in the world, literally. What, why, why, isn't, why isn't there a leading agri-food uh, investment fund in the or with, with billions of, that's actually gonna look around the world, by the way, too, not, but back, look, look for these opportunities, because capital, we need capital as well to be able to do it, so I, I don't know, those are just. Carla? Uh, going back to the value-added opportunities, absolutely the sector has been neglected, um, but, but it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, if you look at other manufacturing sectors in Canada, for example, auto, which has, uh, you know, had the political will, had the dedication and attention, um, the, you know, they're fully automated, whereas, you know, the uh, 2014 KPMG report showed that the food sector actually, the food processing sector is only partially automated, and they could really do with a, a, um, more capital um, and a refurbishing of um, manufacturing facilities. So I think that there's a huge opportunity to grow and I don't think it's impossible to, to meet that. Um, but just another thing is, you know, I have uh, a lot of examples in which um, we have companies that um, have the value added products and they want to get it into Asia and they can't because the, there's either no trade agreements or the focus has been on primary commodities, but they can't get that product that is um, a meat product wrapped in you know, some uh, bread or something, uh, and they can't seem to get that. So I think the international trade agreements also have to keep up. Thank you. Two questions here, and then Gord has a question. Please. Uh, th thank you, uh, Matthias, RBC Economics. Um, uh, Sorry, can you just say your name again? Uh, Matthias Hartpence, RBC Economics. Yeah. Um, my, my question is, um, so I, I recall when I was living in Shanghai and, and doing a study for the, uh, the France's equivalent of the Trade Commissioner Service, the big, it's a question on distribution, the, the big distributors were coming in, the Carrefours, the uh, uh, Walmarts and others, uh, and there was a huge push to try to get shelf space for value-added ag products. Uh, beyond even the wholesale, um, on, on you know, to get this in front of Chinese consumers at the time, uh, it had been opened under the WTO, and so there's that opportunity. Uh, a soft power push as well by uh, the European Commission, the French um, diplomatic service, to try to get uh, the branding um, to educate on products that were unknown then, you know, to most consumers in the city, cheeses and others, um, wines. Um, so the question is, now that we're uh, in a digital era and we see, you know, the developments, for example, with Amazon, uh, the increasing ability to connect directly with consumers and get things quicker and faster, to get, get things quicker, uh, almost at a, in a targeted way to consumers, what have you seen that we should be looking at on the distribution side? Um, again, sort of the Gretzky analogy of going to where the puck is, is going as opposed to where it is. Uh, what are other countries doing in terms of the distribution? What should we be looking at uh, again to connect um, to connect much more uh, uh, in a much more sophisticated way with the uh, 
with the end consumers Thank in you. these emerging markets. Thank you. And Paul, could you ask your question and then we'll, uh, then we'll respond. Thank you. Paul Lansberg with the Forest Products Association of Canada. And this is a, a great discussion. Uh, I'd like to add one other opportunity to the mix, and that is uh, coming from the forest industry, we're innovating to produce more bioproducts from our residues streams. And I think the ag sector is already doing that. There's a lot more opportunity to do that if we're talking about $30 billion of growth in ag food uh, outputs. So that means more, potentially more residues at the farm gate as well as through the processing. So I'd like to get the panel's reaction to uh, how that works in the mix of and what opportunity that represents. Thank you. Gwen, what do you think of Yeah, that? so actually when you talk about uh, use of biofuels in agriculture very much, yeah, we've seen that start and, and there was a comment on the slide around clean technology. And so I think that's all part and parcel of the sustainability uh, uh, initiative to make sure that uh, what's produced is produced sustainably. So I do think that's part of the, part of the solution. Thank you. Uh, there was another question, uh, China, would someone like to, uh, distribution? Yeah, well, I'll just add that, you know, I think my thought about the Ag Food Growth Council is its makeup has to represent what the outcome is, and you've talked about logistics being part of it, and, and so I, I lump together food safety, packaging, and logistics as all part of it, and the Prime Minister nor the Ag Food Council are going to get into the weeds of, of how and what needs to be done by when, but, but I think that's in the, in the early architecture stage, we have to make sure we get the right people uh, at the high level and then working groups that start to develop this strategy. And, and as, the, as the Barton Report talked about, you sort of have the, the sector, the bottom-up growth, and this ag food uh, is to make sure that we have that top-down cohesiveness. So it's not a specific answer to your question, but it, it clearly has to be captured in, in, in that growth strategy. And that digital backbone that brings all of this together, to me, the digital backbone, whether it's related to consumer behavior in China, whether it's related to logistics movement, has got to be a key part of it. Gord, do you have a question? And then we're going to go back to the room. Uh, okay, well, the microphone is at the back. I, I, is that Ron back there? Yeah. Okay, so two questions, if you don't mind. Sorry, sorry, Ron. You got, I got, I beat you. I got Evan. lights and there's distance and <laughs> it's just total chaos here. Thank you, Dave, and, and thank you, Ron. Evan Fraser from the Errol Food Institute at the University of Guelph. I am so delighted by this conversation, so thank you all of you. As we've been talking about this over the last year, the question of risks associated with branding and quality assurance programs comes up. Whether those risks are hacking risks and cybersecurity, whether those risks are linked with linking our export to a brand and all the risks inherent in branding. So I'd ask the panel, what are the risks associated with this? And then critically, how can we proactively manage those risks? Thank you. And then Ron, your question, please. Yeah, thank you. Ron Bonnet, Canadian Federation of Agriculture. Again, a lot of support for what we're seeing coming out in this discussion going forward. The question I would have, though, if we're moving forward with this strategy to really grow our export markets and uh, really increase economic activity, it's not only the federal government that has to be involved. We've got municipal governments and provincial governments in some cases can put obstacles in place that could undo any initiative at the federal level. So I guess the question is, how do you engage other levels in government so that they don't undo some of the progress that's being made at the federal level? This issue came up a lot across the country. Uh, would anyone uh, like to comment on that? Well, Pierre? I mean, I could elaborate. I mean, I, I share Ron's uh, frustration at that. I mean, that is that is a significant impediment if we're all kind of rowing in the same direction, and then uh, a province, for you know, political reasons or whatever, uh, puts up barriers to that to that uh, direction. It, it's a huge impediment. And, and when companies, global companies in particular, when they look at Canada, uh, whether it's Ontario or, or, or BC or whoever is putting up this impediment, they don't differentiate. It's Canada has now a barrier to to uh, innovation. And so that's a, that's, that regulatory uh, alignment is, is significant. Mark, do you have a comment? Well, I, I, from a li our limited experience, I'd have to say uh, it, it can work very well. Usually there's a process of back and forth consultation so the, the federal government's not going in a direction that's completely opposite to where a province might want to go. But when that's done, uh, then it becomes, a, relative to other countries, an interesting system where uh, maybe the federal government has a job to lead, is maybe this is what we're seeing here with the, the Growth Council, and lead in the direction that everybody wants to go so you have a buildup of uh, 
uh, provincial federal effort in, in the same direction as opposed to going like that. It, it does happen, it can, can happen. Just one quick comment, and I want to go back to a CAPI event, I think it was a, a year ago, last November, and I think it was Michael McCain that talked a little bit about, and we were talking about food safety at that time, and it links into the brand and where we want to go. And, you know, I think I uh, very much uh, supported the, the view he had was that we have to be careful in terms of what we implement at a regulatory level in Canada because we have a really diverse marketplace uh, that have very different ideas of what top quality is. And, and, and if I'm correct in, uh, in trying to paraphrase what Mr. McCain said is that we need to have a standard that is aligned on a global level and on a company by company and a customer by customer level that companies in Canada will adapt to meet the needs of that customer. But the concern he expressed that I share is a regulated standard that pushes up costs and requirements for everybody that isn't appropriate for all is, may not be consistent with keeping us economically competitive. So our brand has to be in, uh, at a company level very much to be part of what the consumer of their, their products want. Uh, I think we can be a leader in the global, it's time, you know, Canada can be great again in leading our safe food, our affordable food, our, you know, feeding the world affordably way. But I don't know that I see that underwritten with a backbone of a regulatory approach. Maybe Dominic would like to offer from perspective of how other countries, how do, how do they balance this pursuit of this uh, competitive advantage, consumer protection, societal benefits, but not burdening the sector with undue regulations? Well, someone mentioned um, Australia, which I think we can, we can learn a lot from Brazil. I also think the Netherlands, where there's a, you know, those are, they have very, especially the, I'd say the Netherlands, and New Zealand where they all, all of them go together. It's not, there are trade-offs, but the sense is we can, having a brand where there's a, a standard that's all the way through is gonna be what differentiates us. And so one of the things I think is, this is why I think we need to have the, the consumer view and, get a, and be very, very close to where that is. I don't mean we should just do what the consumers wanna do, but we have, a, have to have a very careful understanding of that. And I think, if I think about the supply chains in, for example, uh, New Zealand, I mean, they are, they're one of the biggest, you know, um, em embracers of the digital backbone because they want to know everything from the grass to the meat to, you, to the, the farm to fork, the simple-minded mind. But they, you want to be able to track that to know what's actually happened, where does it go? It gets a bit to the cybersecurity point. How do we know that this is, I think safety is a very big issue. Nutrition is a very... Um, and, and the last thing I just say on it is I, just back to the comment about where the puck goes, I do think the, you know, we have to forge a deeper relationship with the Alibabas and the Amazons, right? A Ali, or, or another group you may not have heard about called Pingon, it's an insurance company in China, it has data on 850 million consumers. I actually don't know of any organization that has the level of data that, and that's a group, we want to know what those consumers are thinking and where they are, and people are actually bypassing retail, even in food, as you were getting, uh, getting to. And that's a group that we want to keep a very uh, a hand on our pulse and not just be producing stuff to other people to then get it to them, because that's where a lot of the value is. And that will help, I think, inform regulators as well about segmentation, what's required. Um, and, and I think it's more about, the, I think your rowing analogy is a very good one. That's what I worry about is if we say we're going in a particular direction, then someone starts moving and that's where you have to say, we've got to be consistent, whatever it is, for at least a while. <laughs> and then we can step back again and decide where we, which way we want to go, but then let's be consistent for, and not for six months, but for five years, or what, you know what I mean, to, to allow people to invest. Thank you. We, I'm under strict instructions to end at a certain time, okay? So don't kill, shoot the messenger. We have two questions here, and then I want to follow, a finish with a quick comment. I have a question for the panel that might sound familiar to some of you who participated in our roundtables. Uh, but, Gord, you have a question, I believe, and there was one other person over he here. Yes, this gentleman we, right can here. Can we work from the back and... Well, we only have time for two questions, okay? And then, uh, Gord. 
So Peggy Breckfeld, Ontario Federation of Agriculture. We've talked a little bit about value added and I think that's really critical and important. But when we get back to the basics and primary ag, the challenge sometimes is that infrastructure investment that we need to continue to grow. And we are already there with the precision ag. We've got the robotics in, in dairy. We've got the precision ag in how we place that fertilizer right beside which plant needs it. And what plant doesn't, we, we can skip over. We can do all those things. But the challenge is uh, we do need better broadband. We need energy at the right price, and that would be natural gas infrastructure. Excuse me. So I guess that, and on top of that, we need to be able to invest in land that's the right price and protection of that land. So my question, I guess, to the panel, or what I'd love to see an agri-food policy group look at, is how do we, uh, how do we build those types of policies? How do we encourage investment from the entire country, the entire province, in those rural needs? And that rural Ontario, rural Canada, requires investment just as the urban areas do too. Thank you, and last question to Gord. Sorry that we couldn't uh, have more, uh, but you know, secretly we could stay for another two hours if the public policy forum <laughs> doesn't mind. But no. Thank you, David. Uh, Gord Surgeoner, former president of Ontario Agri-Food Technologies, retired. We we talk about farm, food, and beyond, and I, I don't get the beyond side in your report. It's a great report. Congratulations, but. You know, we're now supplying the car parts to the Lincoln Continental. We started off with a great ethanol policy in this province, but not just making fuel ethanol. We now are the number one producer of industrial ethanol that goes for hospital sterilization, all your hand washes. So the, that beyond side, to me, has some tremendous growth opportunities and working with in non-traditional industries and being the suppliers to them. I, I don't see that context within the report. Thank you. So, two meaty questions. Who'd like to, uh, Carla? And then I'd like to bring in Gwen as well on some of that. Sure, just about um, the sustainability and some of the challenges of rural Canada. One thing to keep in mind is that the top manufacturing employer in rural Canada is food manufacturing, um, and which makes it a very unique industry because we're the only manufacturing industry actually that um, is present in every single region, every single province and territory in this country. And it makes sense. We want to be close to the agricultural products and where the products are grown. So I think that you know we all have um, uh, an incentive uh, and to want to keep rural communities um, sustainable, and we can do that by, you know, ensuring the um, prosperity of the entire value chain. Thank you, yeah, Gwen. What I would add to that is, yeah, I think you raised some excellent points. And when I was reading through the report and reading the word sustainability, a lot of times it was in the context of environmental sustainability. But I think there's economic sustainability as well, and I think that's what you're speaking to. So definitely needs to be on the radar when they're working through uh, how this actually materializes. We actually have, I'm allowed one more question, and last question. Thank you very much, David. I'm Michelle Netting with Agrium. My question to the panel uh, is re in regards to those enabling technologies that deliver the co-benefits, whether those are social, economic, or environmental. So we've all talked about whether it's seed technology or value-added production technology, uh, crop input technology. I didn't necessarily see the spot in the plan for the enabling technologies. I felt like maybe it fell under the other subsectors section. Maybe a comment from you as to how those enabling te technologies will be envisioned in this plan going forward. Dominic, do you want to? Sure. It, it act, I, I couldn't agree with you more. We probably weren't very precise about how we talked about it, but it was the four, it, we had sort of four categories. It was the fourth category. It's probably too big of a grouping on because it relates to everything from precision agriculture to um, to, to all of the other, the, the biotech and everything else that go, goes with it. So maybe it probably will need to be broken down into many subcategories. But what we were just trying to highlight is this is not a low tech. A lot of people, th if someone made the comment, it's kind of like going back, farming is the old, it's actually the new world. And, and that's why, you know, even last night there was a push, people saying, well, what, even with the clusters, why couldn't there be a, there should be a protein cluster. That should be one of the, you know, which is a very interesting idea because, of, and it's, it's part of the innovation agenda, not the sector agenda. 
So I don't, but, but you're right, I think we could be more precise. It's pr pr ignorance that we don't understand all the different elements of it. Gordon and Pierre, I'd like to bring you in on this one as well. Yeah, and I, it, it wasn't explicitly noted, and, and I wanted to, it, it is one of the other six areas of opportunity in, in biotechnology, so I think it, it ha we can link these across with health, et cetera. Uh, I think it can be looked at from that lens of that consumer side, the consumer that wants uh, affordable food and affordable health care. Uh, that wants uh, to understand their sustainability, that wants safe food. So we really, this is a tool that enables us to deliver these societal values. And I think when we focus on what consumers are interested in and now ensure that we have the enabling environment to engage all of those in the Canadian economy, then, then we have a global brand. Pierre? Yeah, I mean, I mean we certainly read the report and, and, and included ourselves uh, as part of it, even if, it would, even if it wasn't spelled out in black and white. So certainly that, that fourth bucket, we, we definitely see uh, innovation in, 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 gene, in genetics and, and seed technology and, and, and crop protection fits nicely into that category. Just maybe going back quickly to Rory's comment about consumers. And I think, I think this is one of the, I mean, we've all done, there's a lot of different initiatives underway, excellent initiatives to help improve uh, the, the urban uh, population's understanding of agriculture, and that, that's, that's been excellent work. I think the fact that this report and the spotlight that agriculture has, to me, Oop, it's the like... The spotlight just went off yeah, or something. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of spotlights, um, I, I think we're, we're at the next stage of this education and inf information sharing stage with the public, and I think uh, this report will help uh, launch that next phase, and I think there's, it's, it's imperative for us as the sector to really work together on that step of trying to better inform consumers about uh, our sector, frankly. So in the spirit of launch, and then we're going to conclude this, uh, we asked a question of 150 plus people in eight cities. It was the last question at every round table, and it was a fun question. And we're going to start with Carla, she knows it's coming, and we're going to end with Dominic. Uh, but you have 15 seconds to share a message with the Prime Minister based on this, on this collective work. What is your message to the Prime Minister if he were sitting right in front of you right now? Carla. Uh, well, it would be thank you very much for making the agri-food sector priority for the first time in a generation. Uh, we look forward to meeting the export and growth targets identified, which we will do by continuing to add value to what we grow and produce in this country. Um, and this will help create the Canada that we want with high-tech, innovative, and future-facing jobs in this country for the benefit of all Canadians. Wow. Thank you. Gwen. Yeah, it's hard to top uh, that one. I'd like to say that too. <laughs> that was super. I was going to say thank you in advance for the leadership that he's going to show in uh, making sure that the recommendations and the structure is in, in place in order to uh, accomplish what's recommended in the report. Thank you very much. Mark. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, please uh, implement Barton, short form of it. The, uh, it's the right plan, it's the right analysis, it's the right process, and the opportunity is huge, uh, to quote our friend. <laughs> Pierre. Yeah, I think uh, the ag sector is poised to help with uh, his personal targets of, of climate change, uh, help, you know, helping climate change. Um, the economy, growing the economy, growing the middle class, agriculture's there, we're the solution. And, and we're ready to do it. And then I'd ask him for a selfie for my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> good one, good one. Good. Well, I'm quite shy, so I think I'd say, Prime Minister, give me your pen, because I want to start writing a speech for you. And I think it really talks about food, the dignity of food, uh, food availability for all Canadians, and the role that Canada will play in ensuring that we have secure food for, for a planet and, and take that leadership role. So that's the opportunity, and that's how we'll make Canada great again on a global scale. Dominic. I don't think I can add. I think they should speak to the Prime Minister. I think it'd be very good. The only thing I would say is, you know, thank you, Prime Minister, for, for taking this on, because it would not have the profile it does if he didn't believe it was important. So thank you for embracing it. Uh, but this is not a one-year journey. It's a 10-year journey. So please keep it a priority for 10 years, not one year. Well, you certainly echoed many of the feelings that we heard across the country. And, you know, just thinking of your comment about we don't want South Korea to own, uh, own Canada. We want uh, Canadian agri-food to own the global food marketplace. So 
Everybody, thank you very much for taking time. Thank you to the Public Policy Forum and to our panel, and most importantly, I should call out uh, the Council and Dominic Barton for sharing his views with us today. Thank you very much. So I think after this morning, the PPF will need to lead a uh, Canadian delegation to the Netherlands. <laughs> Upcoming, you can sign up at the door. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you to Dominic. Thank you to the panel. Thank you for David McInnes. Um, as an outsider to the sector, um, the statistics that Dominique presented this morning and the numbers were, were simply staggering. And I think it shows and tells so much of a story about the untapped potential. Um, I find it interesting, the whole question around champions. And we had a project development session for this about six months ago and there was you know often talk of the need for champions and yet you've got you know the chair of Morneau's Economic Growth Council taking notes throughout the session you've got provincial clerks sitting in the room taking notes you have the federal minister who came out to our roundtable sessions you've got Ilsa Trunick banging on the table for ag um, so everything is there it's the uh, the perfect storm per se and there's huge opportunity for the sector to come together and I think that that's been a polite message that has been under lying in many of the messages this morning is really the need for the sector to come together. Um, I think also the, the whole question of branding is interesting. You know, we often see branding as a bit of a, a shallow uh, discussion around the branding of the sector. And, you know, looking in this room, obviously there's a huge opportunity for women in agriculture. Um, there's a huge opportunity in terms of telling the opportunity um, to young people, the entrepreneurship, the innovation angle, um, which is really an un untold story within Canada and, and obviously very important. Um, um, PPF will definitely be um, continuing our work in this area with our partners, advancing the discussion, and we're open to your feedback in terms of how we can best do that. In terms of Dominic's uh, comments regarding the pension funds, they're all in the room tonight. We've got the Prime Minister, we've got Ron Mock, we've got Michael Sabia, we've got uh, Mark Macon, and uh, you can start your, uh, your story this evening. Um, many of the organizations in the room today are members of the Public Policy Forum. Uh, Public Policy Policy Forum is a membership-based organization. We don't have core funding. We count on our members, and we're really grateful for your support um, in terms of advancing our work um, to, build, to build a better Canada. So thank you very much for the support of our members for being there, and uh, we hope that many of you will be joining us for the Grow Summit today, and, and thank you to all of you for being here. <laughs>